Shalom, my friends. Welcome to this uh, very special, very personal video that uh, I've titled Matan. <laughs> this has been something that's been going on in my heart for quite a number of weeks. Uh, Elohim spoke to me and he says, I want you to make a uh, make my matan to you a matan to your chavarim, my kodeshim. And um, I just, you know, it kept going on and on in my mind. And um, I looked up the uh, Aramaic Hebrew word for gift and uh, discovered the word matan. Shortly after that, it came up in one of our uh, word studies on uh, Thursdays. But, um, you know, Michelet, Proverbs 18, uh, verse 16 says, A man's matan, that is his gift, opens a way for him and brings him before great men. Now, uh, some of you know that my early years, uh, I was in the music industry full time, really from the age of 16 and until I was around 50. And uh, oh, I lived in Los Angeles for 10 years. I grew up in New Jersey, lived in Nashville for 10 years uh, during the 80s and very early 90s. And I was out in Los Angeles in the late 60s and early 70s, and uh, as, Yahweh's word says, my gift made a way for me in the world and b brought me before great men as well. Now, I know it's a gift, my uh, singing, playing instruments, writing songs, and early on, when I was, um, oh, certainly by the time I was 18 or 19, and people would talk to me about my songwriting, um, I would uh, make a very clear look. I can't write songs. You know, they would look at me cross-eyed. I'd say, look, I've tried. Um, I've tried to write a song, you know, come up with an idea, oh, I want to write a song about this, sit down and use everything I've got to write a song. And uh, whenever I did that, they always, they sucked. <laughs> Just to be blunt and honest, they sucked. But there was this other thing that would go on where um, I loved playing the guitar. I love the sound of it, and um, a chord progression would, uh, would come up, and I'd be having fun with that, and in that chord progression, I would just hear a melody, and I would start singing it, and then words would come, and um, I started telling people, say, look, you know, I can't write songs, but um, the Father gives me songs, and um, those, there, it's a gift. I know it's a gift, a matan, because it's not something I can do on my own. It's something that honestly is given to me. So um, that's, what, uh, <laughs> that's what this is all about. I, uh, after much prayer, I uh, went through a bunch of my songs and um, I picked the ones that really mean the most to me. There are uh, 13 songs. Uh, they're listed, of course, on the CD here and also on the card here at the bottom. And uh, I want to talk to you about each one of these songs and share personal stories with you about them. But uh, I also want to cite... Uh, Koheleth, that's Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19, that says, When Elohim has given any man riches and wealth and possessions and has given him the power and ability to enjoy them 
and to receive his portion and rejoice in his labor. This is a matan of Elohim to him. So um, I've picked uh, 13 songs that really mean a lot to me, have always meant a lot to me. These are songs that um, I wrote and recorded, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, in the 80s and 90s, a long time ago. The picture of me on the, uh, the cover uh, represents that period of time. But uh, it represents Elohim's matan to me, and um, I want to make it a matan to you. And I will send you a copy of the matan CD. Absolutely free. This is a gift from me to you. You know, my friend, some three months ago I left YouTube and I asked you all to come over to Vimeo with me and <laughs> you all flocked over with me. You showed me your love, your support, and um, this is my way of saying thank you. Now, uh, Matan is spelled very simply Mem Tau Nun. You can see it in Strong's uh, H4976. But Mem is a picture of water. It has to do with being washed by the word and saved by Yeshua's blood. Tau, picture of crossed sticks, Yahweh's signature, his mark. Nun, picture of a seed, the seed of Yeshua. Represents unstoppable motion, uh, the heirs of Yeshua. The heart of this word is Tau, having Yahweh's mark, his indwelling Ruach, and that is surrounded by Mem and Tau, which has to do with being washed by and growing in his word, Yeshua, and being in an absolutely unstoppable way the seed of Yeshua, Yeshua's heir. Matan, the word we know as uh, gift. Now, um, the rest of this video, I'm going to be talking to you about the songs, uh, little personal stories and whatnot. You might want to, uh, you know, wait until you get your copy of the CD, and then you can come back and uh, listen to what I have to say about each song. Whatever. These songs were all written, like I said, some years ago. You'll hear me singing words in some of them, like God instead of Yahuwah, Jesus instead of Yeshua, Lord instead of Adon, and Christ instead of Mashiach. But please understand, these songs were written way before anyone ever heard the Aramaic Hebrew proper names and, and titles. And I naturally was writing to the understanding of those people at that time. Now, track number one. You'll recognize this as the song you hear in the intros and outros of my word studies. It's titled, Who Do You Say? And it's one of my absolute favorite. Um, I wrote this... I was... Um, I was living in Nashville at the time, but um, I had come home to New Jersey uh, for a visit, and uh, I was driving into New York City, and I was about to enter the Lincoln Tunnel. Traffic, big time, backed up as usual. And I was just sitting there, and I'm looking, and <laughs> just at the top, above the tunnel, spray painted and blue paint, it said, Jesus saves. And I thought, geez, 2,000 years later, and people are still writing his name in graffiti. No one. Who's ever been that famous? No one. And, uh, you know, I kept thinking about that. and Went back to Nashville, and uh, there was a three-day weekend coming up. And um, I told everybody I was I was not going to be around. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to to uh, seek Elohim uh, through prayer and ask him to give me this song. 
and I was studying in Matith Yahu, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, where Yeshua asks his Talmudim, Who do men say that the bane of Adam is? Who do they say I am? And they answered, saying, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the Nevi'im, the prophets. And then Yeshua asked them again, He said, What about you? Who do you say I am? There was some pause. I can only imagine. This is a moment <laughs> of extreme testing in the presence of the Adon. And finally, it was Kepha who said, You are the Mashiach, the bane of the living Elohim. And Yahshua replied, Baruch are you, Shimon bar Yonah because flesh and blood men have not revealed this to you but my father who is in the Shamaim and I tell you on this rock on this rock the rock is not Peter picture Yeshua patting his own chest and saying on this rock Yeshua is the rock I will build my called out ones and the gates of the grave will not overcome it. Well, you know, much prayer. I was jamming and playing this song for three days. I mean, from the time I got up until the time I went to bed, that's all I was doing for three days was just playing this, getting it to come out, and then uh, for many, many days after that, all day long, I would just keep playing this song over and over and over and over and over so that I could get my delivery of it, of each word, each line, perfectly ingrained in my soul so that when I performed it, it would be all I could give. It was recorded in my home studio with me singing and playing guitar um, probably 15 years ago, much later after I wrote the song. Uh, and then I overdubbed backup vocals, a baritone dulcimer and some digital con congas. So everything on this song uh, that you hear is, is me playing and singing. Now I always have a favorite line in my songs and my favorite line in this one is 2,000 years have gone by it's just another working day some would rather let it lie but the question still remains who do you say he is? Track number two is titled Naked Moon you'll recognize this one it's the song you hear in the intros and outros of all my newscasts this, um, this song, in some ways, took decades to come out of me. Uh, initially, it goes way back, I was um, maybe 28 years old and just divorced, uh, sitting on my mom's porch in New Jersey after midnight, late at night, summertime. And there was a mockingbird out somewhere nearby in a tree doing his thing. And I love, I have fallen in love with mockingbirds, my friends. If you ever had a mockingbird outside your window on a, any particular summer, you'll never forget it because they sing all night long. They're nocturnal. And they, uh, they memorize all, as many other bird songs that they can find they they also memorized sounds and noises I mean I heard I heard a mockingbird he was imitating a squeaky wheel on a carriage <laughs> they're amazing and I sat there and I tried counting how many different calls this mockingbird had and um, I guess I came up to around 60 and I wrote a poem titled 60 quotations from a mockingbird. Um, 
And then it was, uh, I don't know, almost, well, probably 15 years later, uh, one night I was playing the guitar and I just got onto that just banging on the bottom strings on the guitar and up there I'd hit a chord you know it was a lot of fun to play and these lyrics started flying out of me like they had already been written sometimes you know like uh, who do you say I, I spent three days getting that song out there are other times where the song just comes out in as much time as it takes to sing it. It they just just flows out. Talk about a matan, a gift. My favorite line in this one is actually a whole verse. I just love this verse. And it goes, mocking bird nocturnal sings, notations of eternal things, entering the quantum breeze, flying not for want of wings, he lights his gaze on you and me, simply because we matter. Now this recording was our first take in a 24-track studio, two-inch tape, beautiful recording studio. Uh, of course, me singing and playing guitar. Perry Heller uh, on percussion, playing congos and things. He also uh, is a photographer and took the picture of me that you see on the cover. A uh, wonderful, wonderful bassist named Bob Hart on fretless electric bass guitar. If you play bass, try and figure out what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, two lovely ladies, Chris Lee and Leah Koloff, playing cellos. Uh, playing parts that I had to write for them. I wrote their cello parts by whistling. I mean, I said, look, just play, you know, jam. Some musicians, you know, that are trained, they don't know how to play. They had to have music paper, you know, they had to read in order to play. I says, look, play this. And I just started whistling things and got them to write it down. And <laughs> I know, you know, learn something, you learn something new every day, right? But uh, that was that one. Now, track number three, here's, man, this is, it's titled Planet of Love. A love song? I don't know. Um, kind of a, a story of my life when it comes to my search for a woman. The first time. This, my friends, it starts out when I was five years old. <laughs> Honestly. Opens up with, I can still remember the first time. By the railroad, in the tall fields, by the railroad tracks, here in uh, New Jersey, where I grew up, and I was five, and um, I met this little girl named Susie, little blonde, baloney curls, and we just we connected, I, and for I imagine for two years. Her and I were together every day. We loved each other. We were in love with each other as much as four and five year old children can be. And let me tell you, that's a pretty, it's a space, it's so innocent, it's so pure. But um, we were living in what used to be army barracks. Kind of a temporary housing situation and they were getting ready to tear them down so they could build uh, New Brunswick High School. Which, you know, now I'll drive past Brunswick High and uh, on the right-hand side, the front lawn is where my bedroom used to be. I used to sleep and play there. But anyway, that's where I met little Susie. And, um, like I said, every day, a couple of years, well, then everybody had to start moving out because they were tearing them down to build the high school. She moved first, and the day that she was leaving, 
Um, we were together as long as we could be. Then she had to leave, go get in the car. I hid in a bush where no one could see me except her. She knew where I was, and I was crying. Amazing. I was seven years old. And she got in the back of the station wagon. She was at the back window looking at me. She could see me. I was looking at her. I could see her. The car starts driving away. We held eye contact as long as we could. And that was it. I, you know, I didn't know, how am I going to find her again? That's what this song is all about. Uh, never did, of course. My favorite line in this one is, quote, I can still hear her voice every time I fall, saying, <laughs> You still haven't gotten over this wall. My bassist, Mike Toth, and I recorded this song live in one take in Mike's basement using a four-track TAC tape recorder and some microphones on me and my guitar. Um, you know, another point is the very end of the song, I sing, Wake Up, Little Susie, Wake Up. Well, like I said, I was seven years old. I don't know, a couple of weeks later, we moved out of there, and I moved on to uh, Home Street, and, uh, in my personal videos, you'll see a video of my 13th birthday party that's on Home Street. <laughs> and, uh, but at the age of seven, I remember one day I walked in the house. The television was on. My sisters had a program on called American Bandstand. And the Everly Brothers were on stage playing their guitars, singing beautiful harmonies. Wake up, little Susie, wake up, boom ba -doom -ba -doom boom Wake up, little Susie. And I, I locked, and I said, these guys are on TV. If I was on that stage on TV, I could be singing about Susie. She'd see me, we'd get back together. I mean, I was seven years old. Maybe that's when I decided I was going to, you know, write songs and, you know, get on TV and find Susie. <laughs> So that last line, wake up little Susie, wake up, is a reference to that call that I received when I saw the Everly Brothers singing that hit song. Track number four, uh, a bit of a continuing theme. This one's titled Hard to Find. This has a lot to say about my divorce and feelings of disillusionment about having lost what I thought was true love, you know, till death do us part. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> this song was written, however, specifically about a very special girl by the name of Matresa Berg. I uh, met Matresa when I was in Nashville. A few years after my divorce, I, you know, I was um, very crushed by my divorce. I mean, I really believed, um, it, you know, till death do us part. And it, was, um, it was a crushing blow. It really messed me up for quite a few years. It, you know, drew me closer to Elohim, which is a good thing. But anyway, here I am in Nashville, and uh, there's this girl, Matresa. Whew, boy, talk about a songwriter. Throughout the 80s and into the 90s, Matresa was writing songs for all the country artists. If you, if you like country music uh, and you have favorite songs from the 80s or 90s, chances are a lot of them were written by Matresa. Uh, she had 10 hit songs on the radio at any given time through the 80s and 90s. She's an amazing songwriter. We wrote songs together. I had a good friend at RCA Records, um, a girl named Tabitha. She called me one day. She says, Alan, she says, uh, Matresa wants to meet you. She wants to make you dinner at my house. And uh, So anyway, I went over and Matresa made dinner. It was a wonderful dinner. And Matresa and I were, we were just locked in for three years. I don't think I have ever 
desired a relationship with anyone after my divorce as much as I did Matresa. But I don't know, either I couldn't open up again or the Ruach was telling me she doesn't belong to you. I don't know what, but we spent a lot of time together, but I never would open that door. And uh, my favorite line in this song is, I've got steel in my spirit, steel on my six-string guitar, just like the steel on the, in the tracks of trains that come home in the dark. I just, just love that line. Now this one was recorded live in a small recording studio just a couple of blocks away from me here in New Jersey. Just me and my guitar. And uh, anyway, let's go on to track number five. This one makes an even stronger point. This one's tied, titled Tide of Hearts. Another song about Matresa. And it is, I think, honestly, my friends, I think this is one of the most magnificent love songs that have ever come out of me. I don't know, maybe because it's so personal, but it talks about how I was unable to open up. I mean, it talks about how I would look at Matresa. She's everything I would ever want. And yet I wouldn't do anything about it. And my favorite line in this one is, I'm just a man. After all, I'm just a man. Playing with the undertow in a tide of hearts. And I guess that's how I saw it. It was like an, under, an undertow will kill you. <laughs> the undertow just, you know, brings you out in the ocean and buries you, you know. And I, I was playing with that undertow. I, I just think this song says so much about me and my feelings. And this one was recorded at home in Nashville one very hot autumn evening with just one microphone sitting in front of me and my guitar. All the windows were open, crickets are chirping outside. <laughs> Feelings of solitude, real lo-fi. I mean, there's no, no great quality to the recording of this song, but I think um, there's a great quality in my heart uh, in delivering these lyrics that mean so much to me. I hope you agree. Track number six, titled Right as Rain. Still an ongoing thing. Uh, some years later, after Matresa had left Nashville and back in New Jersey, and um, this was another song. It was so hard to get this song out of me. I, I had this this riff on the guitar that you hear in the opening. Just one chord. I was just like two chords actually going back and forth, and and I I couldn't get I couldn't get a lyric out of me. So at the time I was driving an El Camino, Chevy El Camino, early 70s, very cool car, and, uh, souped up a bit, kind of like my my truck is now. But I was driving to El Camino and I said, I gotta get out of town. I, 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 I gotta get this song out of me. So a friend of mine had a cabin up in the Pocono Mountains. And I drove up to the Poconos for a weekend. And uh, such a hard time getting this out. I, I still, I couldn't get anything out. So I just jumped in the El Camino, uh, went for a ride into town. Uh, and it was raining. It was just raining. It was like a Saturday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Went into town. Uh, I don't know, maybe I went into a nightclub or something, had a glass of wine. 
nothing was happening. I was just frustrated. Got back in the El Camino and started driving back. Stopped at a red light, looked in my rear view mirror, and uh, there was two girls in an Astro van behind me. White girl driving, black girl in the passenger seat. And uh, <laughs> that's all that happened, you know? That night, I went back to the cabin, but it brought the lyrics out. Two girls in my rear view mirror, black and white like ink on paper, trying to write a song. And, you know, that was it. It came out. It happened. And, you know, it just goes on. More expressions about my own frustrations about uh, my love life. And at this point, you know, I also had another girl in my life who was my daughter, Michelle. Uh, at that point, she was, uh, well, in her early teens, I guess. Maybe her late teens. And uh, my favorite line in this one, it's another whole verse. And it's about my daughter, really. It says, I keep a picture of love in my back pocket a piece of my life in a golden locket, pathos on a chain. <laughs> ah, who knows what it means. Maybe the memories are all we really keep. Say I'm taking it too seriously, but I can't throw it away. It's a picture of my daughter. This was recorded in the same live session with my bassist, Mike Toth, in his basement. Piscataway, New Jersey, in one take, again using a four-track TAC tape recorder, quarter-inch tape, and some microphones on me and my guitar. Right as rain, I, I could play this song anytime, anywhere. It's one of the most fun songs, next to Naked Moon, or I could say like Naked Moon, Right as Rain, my two favorite songs to play. They're just, they're just fun to play play uh, on the guitar and sing. Track number seven is titled Houses of Healing. You know, this was written pretty much right after or during my divorce. There was some, you know, I went to, I left and went back to Jersey. I was living upstate New York. I built a house. I bought a little railroad train station called Sweet Station from a doctor sweet was a chiropractor. Uh, it was just a little thing. I, I built a two, uh, two-story two house like onto it, matched all the gingerbread and the overhang stuff. And that's while I was married. When I left, that was upstate New York, out in the country. Now I'm back in New Jersey. I'm staying with my parents. There were some very comforting conversations with my beloved dad. He helped me in some amazing ways. But most of all, my relationship with Elohim is what healed me of what I can now say was the most devastating disappointment of my life. My favorite line in this one is, Yours was the door leading in. Yeshua is the door. And it was the door leading into the next room I could walk into and find my healing. I recorded this one in my home studio uh, here in New Jersey. Track number eight is titled Father and Son. This one was primarily inspired by Yeshua's prayer to the Father in the book of Yohanan, John chapter 17, that his Kodeshim would be made one with him as he is one with Yahweh. And also, it's about the struggle we go through in developing a relationship with someone we can't see or touch. Elohim, presently, we can't see or touch him. Um, and, you know, it's about my own dad. Check out those headlights, they just don't shine like they used to. He uh, passed away. And then uh, a line in there about my Jiddu, my grandfather. My daddy used to talk about the book of Revelation, tears of joy. There's nothing wrong with your eyes. 
rolling down his face. I mentioned that in my book, Road to Paradise. That's one of my favorite lines in this song. Uh, and the line about Yeshua's prayer to Abba, Father, in Yochanan 17. He said, I'm in you, you're in me. We were made eternally one. Echad. <laughs> Track number nine is titled Bed of Roses. This is a very interesting song to me. I, I don't know. Man, that... I don't even remember when I wrote it, where I was. It just came out of me one night like, bam. I mean, it, in the time, it, the, the music, the lyrics, everything, like it was written a long time ago, just boom, it just came out of me. It's crazy. Uh, you know, just like, here's a song. And, and, you know, I listened to it and it's, very special things being said. It's about wanting to go home. Net Chatef. We've been talking so much about this lately, my friends. This one's about wanting to go home. We are not of this world. And like it says in the first verse, home is no place I can find here in this world. My favorite line in this one is, Two blackbirds flying high, one for those who say hello, and one for those who have said goodbye. One for those who have said goodbye. That line just makes me think about the Netchatef, those who are taken saying hello, and those who are left behind. Goodbye. This is truly a lo-fi recording. It was recorded using a little handheld cassette tape recorder that was sitting on the kitchen table at my daughter Michelle's house. One night, I mean, you know, it's a noisy, lo-fi recording, but nonetheless, you can hear the song. Michelle's boyfriend, my daughter Michelle, Chris Ingram, is playing acoustic fretless bass guitar. Uh, you can tell he has a lot of fun playing that thing. And of course, I'm singing and playing guitar. But a uh, very, very special song to me, so I included it in this package. Track number 10. Ugh, powerful song. This is titled Wishes. My favorite line in this one is, You won't hear the angels cry every time you don't believe. I co-wrote this song with a good friend of mine in Nashville. Kevin Monroe and it's kind of funny how the lines came out like Kevin would say I could say a prayer but it wouldn't make any difference and then I'd come back with yeah because I could tell the truth and you wouldn't believe and that's how this song came out the two of us would get together I don't know once a week and uh, put this song together I took off with it I, I fell in love with this song I still um, I think it's one of my most powerful performance deliveries. Um, Kevin, I don't think, ever sang it. He was, he was out performing in town, but I don't think he ever um, took on. I did. And um, I sang this song in Austin, Texas. A friend of mine invited me down to Austin. A guy who uh, was on the management team was ZZ Top. And at, while I was in town, the Austin Songwriters Association was putting on a show. And uh, this friend of mine got me on stage. Now, it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I'd perform anywhere. You know, I just love getting up in front of people and, and singing. But they put me on stage with three other songwriters. And they would do a thing called Writers in the Round. We got four songwriters on stage. One guy would sing a song. Then the next songwriter would be like, oh, that reminds me of something. And he'd sing a song. Then the next guy would sing one. And then I would sing one. And then it would go back over. Well, I didn't know it, but the other three songwriters were big hit songwriters. I mean, they all had songs in the top ten all over the place. <laughs> 
I didn't. I always avoided the industry. The industry, you know, would make offers to me, and I would just like leave me alone. I, I liked, you know, live performances on stage. That's all I was interested in. The record companies and all that they had to offer to me was, I don't know, it was like, it's like shoveling dirt onto a beautiful meal. I, you know, I just stayed away from it. Anyway, on stage. <laughs> with three other songwriters and we're all introduced as hit songwriters and I'm like well wait a minute that doesn't include me at any rate uh, that's how it was and uh, this song Wishes was the last song of the night and I am telling you it brought the house down there was all kinds of uh you know, big players in the music business because it was the Austin Songwriters Association show. So, you know, all the people playing the political business games in the music industry were there. The show was over. This is the last song. And I got off stage and put my guitar away. And I was walking across this big expanse, wooden floor. And way off in the distance, this girl is running at me like a freight train. I mean, she was running across the floor, and she like kept coming right at, at me. I mean, it's not like she was going to go over there. She was coming directly towards me. At one point, I stopped. She threw her arms around me. Uh, she may have even thrown her legs around me. I might have been standing there carrying her for a moment. She's kissing me on the lips. It's a good kiss. I'm kissing her back, and I'm going like, what's going on? Turned out this girl's name is Debbie Beinhorn. She, at the time, was a vocal instructor for all the big stars. I mean, uh, uh, what's her name? Whitney Houston. Uh, she was instructing Whitney Houston and Celine Dion. You could go on and on and on. This was like the, the most popular vocal instructor there was. So we spent a little time together that evening, and, and I asked her, I said, look, you know, Debbie, you're like it. What can you tell me about, you know, my voice? She says, Alan, I couldn't teach you anything. You're doing everything I'm trying to teach them to do. Yeah. Trying to teach them to sing in the Ruach is a problem because they're all so caught up in fame and fortune that they tend to be too much in the flesh. She's trying to teach them how to get in the Ruach and they can't figure that out. But anyway, this is another song I recorded in that live session with my bassist, Mike Toth. Again, just one take. We were, we were performing a lot together, had these songs down, my friends. And uh, this was recorded in his basement. Four track T act tape recorders, some microphones on me and my guitar. But that song, I, boy, that song has really stirred uh, some audiences in the past. Track number 11 is titled Get Satisfied. Now, this, this song goes back to the, uh, the 80s. I was up in Oneonta, New York, uh, and there was a church up there that. I really enjoyed attending. That had been like one of the only times I ever attended any church for any period of time. Whenever, I mean, I was living in Nashville and I would visit upstate New York and whenever I was up there I would go to this church because it was really spirit-filled for a while. They wound up falling apart like they always seem to do. But anyway, I was asked to perform at uh, Oneonta College and uh, I prayed, I got before Abba, I said, Abba, you know, I'm going to be doing this in college. I want a song that would speak to these young college kids who didn't know yet what it was like to be born from above. I want to talk to those who haven't seen the difference between seeking satisfaction and finding satisfaction. And just a few days before the performance, this song came out, quick, easy. Um, 
Now this recording uh, was done much later. My favorite line in this one is, When you look to the world, there ain't nothing you will find. Uh, recorded this in my home studio probably around 15 years ago. Uh, with me singing and playing guitar and then overdubbing parts with my McSpadden teardrop dulcimer a 1966 Honer chromatic uh, harmonica that I've had since I was 15 years old and digital congas track number 12 is titled Kingdom Come uh, seeing how the world around us is moving at breakneck speed directly towards a massive brick wall. Knowing how obvious it is that the Earth itself cannot go much farther into the future is what inspired this song. My favorite line in this one is, once that cry has reached your ears, your heart gets filled by what you hear. And what you hear is just the sound of you crying Kingdom Come. This was also recorded in my home studio with me singing and playing my McSpadden teardrop dulcimer and then overdubbing backup vocals, my McSpadden baritone dulcimer and digital congas. And Track number 13, the last one is titled Straight and Narrow. I love this song. It's really, it's a lot of fun to play. Uh, if you're a guitarist and you figure out what I'm doing on the guitar, you'll be amazed because it's just like two chords. That's just being done over and over and over and over and over from the beginning until the end of the song. That's it. It's the whole song. And yet the song goes through all these changes. It's really kind of neat. Again, that's Elohim's matan to me. I don't know how to do those things. It just happens. I've had, I've had people, graduates of Juilliard, come up to me at performance saying, how did you come up with the idea to do this, that, and the other thing? And I says, by not knowing how. I don't even know what you're asking me. I don't know nothing. <laughs> Just have fun. Straight and narrow, this song is about life, religion, money, popularity, all the illusions that the world presents as reality and attempts to ask some questions about it all. Matith Yahu, Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 tells us that straight and narrow and Hard pressed, compressed is the way which leads to high true life. And few are those who find it. That's what this song is all about. My favorite line in this one is All those clowns who hold you down can always be found when you lose your way. This song was recorded along with Naked Moon during the same 24-track studio session, two-inch tape, beautiful studio, with me, of course, singing and playing guitar, Perry Heller on percussion, Bob Hart on amazing fretless electric, electric bass guitar, and Chris Lee and Leah Koloff on uh, cellos. And that, my friends, is my matan to you. My gift to you. Just a way of saying, thank you for being with me, for supporting me, coming over to Vimeo with me in such great force when I left YouTube. I appreciate you, my friends. And I just wanted to say something I just wanted to do something to say thanks. And uh, that's what this is. All you got to do is give me your mailing address, nothing else, and um, I'll put one in the mail to you. 
I don't care where you live, you're overseas, I don't, you know, those packages can cost money to send, doesn't matter, get me your proper mailing address, be very careful how you, like, write it out, like, sometimes when it's overseas, they look a little crazy to me, they're not like American addresses, make sure you, you do each line the way it should be on the package, please. <laughs> if you can't uh, connect me using the link, beneath this video, then also beneath this video, you'll see my P.O. box. You can, uh, you know, send me a quick note with your mailing address, and I'll get one out to you right away. These just came in today's mail. The UPS guy, I love this guy. His name is Magnum. So he's a great person. Uh, he delivered these to me today. I just got them, and here I am sitting in front of the camera to so excited to let you know about this and to um, to give you my matan as a matan to you <laughs> and uh, that's it my friends until next time Elohim's mighty beracha on you and yours Shalom Chavarim Some would rather let it lie, but the question still remains.